And that'll be the facility for the day. And I'm going to announce uh, the agenda going forward. We'll do a very short icebreaker, and then we'll have a discussion by our presenter, uh, Kevin. We'll be doing a discussion about co-op movement, about the co-op movement, and their presentation on business systems, and then we'll split into groups and get one-on-one -on -one feedback. Uh, and that should carry us through to about seven, and then we'll take a break. Um, so as a short icebreaker, uh, that's not about um, interest, compound interest. Does everyone <laughs> have a coin in their pocket? Who uses those things? Who's got a coin in their pocket? And pull it. And if you don't have a coin, I have a penny for you. <laughs> and if, if you need, if you, if you could borrow one, I've only got a few extra. I could lend them pennies. Ventures Inc. and the Works Printing Cooperative, um, and uh, this is 1960. So my parents uh, still hadn't met yet. Um, they were both out of high school, living in around Worcester, living the dream. And uh, thank goodness they met after this. <laughs> My name is Amy. I'm with the Figures Landscaping Co-op, and I have 2014. So <laughs> <laughs> I found the diggers this year. I got 1980. Who are you, sir? Um, 
<laughs> was not born then at all. <laughs> not at all? What's no. your name? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Sergio Castillo. I'm with Future Focus Media Co-op. <coughs> and uh, what our heritage is or something? Oh, okay, all right. Um, it's born here, but my mom is from the Dominican Republic and my dad's from Ecuador. And yeah. My name is Azar, and I'm from Soul Church Pedicab Co-op from Providence. Happy to be here in the flesh this week. Um, and I got the year 2000, when I have a year. I was 13 in seventh grade, and hope it, I remember hoping the world wasn't going to end when it turned to 2000. Why <laughs> <laughs> choose like, K scare or whatever? I also had braces and was really geeky. <laughs> Good times. My name is Katie. I'm also with Soul Charis in Providence. I got in 1996, and 1996 is the year that I moved to the States. So now I've been, that's a long time. Now I've been here 18 years. That's very strange. So that was a big year for me. On my uh, the first step on my track to becoming American. <laughs> from, from where? Um, I moved from Canada, but I was born in England. Yeah. I'm Haji. I'm from Thirty here in Worcester, and I'm working on the greenhouse project. I got 1982. So my parents were both younger than I am right now. Uh, yeah, they haven't met yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My name is uh, um, Mike, and I'm with uh, the Diggers Co-op. And yeah, just uh, I just uh, started not that long ago, so it's been pretty good. I got a 1994, which is yeah, the year I was born. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was being born. Lots of crying. It's a birthday coin. (laughs) (laughs) I'm Judy, and I'm with the Diggers Landscaping Co-op. I have 2009, and that was my first year with Stone Soup. I'm Tovia. I'm from the Diggers Landscaping Co-op, and uh, I got 1999. I was 10 years old. Um, I just building forts in the woods, going to, uh, going to school. Um, uh, I'm Matt Feinstein, I'm with Worcester Roots Project and also repping the Future Focus Media Co-op. Um, and I got 1984, I was just a wee one, I was, I was three. And I was on a farm in Western Massachusetts chasing pigs and chickens in my job. When I was three, I think I was already helping get the eggs out of the chicken and stuff like that. Hi, my name is Kate. I'm with Future Focus Media Co-op.
and where you were 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> I was working at a nail factory, so this is here for me. Very <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sissy Farina. Cuidado, mi niña. She said, watch my kids. Very cool. Hi, I'm Sophia. Um, and I think I was in the ninth grade um, in Rhode Island, you know, studying and being a student and all that, playing soccer and things like that. Very cool. Uh, my name is Maria, and 10 years ago, I was probably babysitting. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Thanks everybody for coming. Quite a full room. Uh, oh, the food was delicious. <laughs> now that's going to end our icebreakers and I'm going to welcome up Kevin to give us a presentation about the co op movement. <laughs> so, everybody, help me and welcome me. Come here. <laughs> what I use in my own business now to explain how we do business and um, it's not meant to be a hierarchy, uh, it's just meant to remind you of all the functions that have to happen every day for a business to work. Uh, I think it's some of the collateral that Matt sent out, he described the business as a human body. Uh, I think that's a great way of looking at it. Uh, I think there are lots of analogies. I often would just use a, a watch. Uh, you know, each one of these functions is a gear. And I guess I'm dating myself a little bit and thinking that watches have gears. Um, but uh, uh, if you've ever seen a, a watch function, um, lots of little gears are what move ultimately the arms. Um, you can actually take certain gears out of a watch and the watch will still go around as if it, it's keeping time, but it's actually losing time. And if, if those gears are missing, uh, eventually you lose a minute or an hour or a day. Um, and I hate to be corny, but <coughs> time is money. And uh, eventually your business will go bankrupt if you're not functioning in all these categories. So what I did with this was I, I tried to leave parts of it blank because I don't know what everybody here does. Um, and it, it would be helpful for me if I could just understand a little bit better about what your co-ops do. I understand 
understand future focus and what that does. But other than that, uh, I'm a little bit at a loss. So can you just give me a, a couple of sentences from a, a few of the co-ops? So we do um, landscaping services, design, installation, maintenance, do hardscapes, basically landscaping services with a permaculture, through a permaculture lens, with the concerns about sustainability and That sounds like a regular business to me. Uh, and uh, what do you guys do? We're Solterics. We are a um, bike taxi delivery and uh, tours company that operates all by pedal power. So, and we also offer advertising. Very fun. Yes, lots of fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what do you do uh, as of this week? <laughs> Uh, it was originally a uh, an LLC, but we make uh, these little USB robot controllers. Um, you plug into a computer and lets your computer become a robot. Really? So they just converted. From just, uh, doing a conversion, uh, uh, turning over ownership to the workers. Very cool. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, traditionally in this chart, um, you have a board of directors um, that. Overseen what what the company does and advise the company on how to do it. Uh, I think all of you are board members uh, of your own companies. Uh, what uh, what typically a board does is uh, hire, in your case, elect a manager uh, to oversee the day to day operations, uh, so that you don't have to have a collective decision on uh, every single. general management. General management's function is to make sure that all the gears are working. Um, general manager or manager uh, would have uh, consultants and attorney and accountants, um, mentors, industry specific consultants, um, and would also have some form of a CFO um, and bookkeeping function. Under that, um, in this in this structure, you have the five functions of marketing, uh, of selling, of operating, of producing, and of developing the product that you're selling. Um, I can get into each one of the individual functions, but um, you know it's interesting for me to learn this map because um, I actually started working the very first company I worked with was uh, a group of Clark students um, had uh, started making t-shirts out of their dorm or weren't making t-shirts out of their dorm they were getting t-shirts made out of their dorm Um, they had a local screen printer who was printing them and uh, by the time they graduated Clark they were already selling a couple million dollars a year of t-shirts they moved their operation to New York, and when they finally went on the business, they were doing about $85 million a year in sales. Um, I was lucky enough to work with uh, them and their consultants who explained this chart to me. I didn't learn it in school, and, um, I didn't go to school for business. Um, everything I've learned about business has been uh, on the job, so to speak. But as the industry started to slide out of the country, um, I went into more and more businesses who were struggling um, to deal with uh, the tidal flux of business coming in and out. Um, and every time I met a small business owner, it seemed that they only thought of two things that they were selling and producing. And they didn't think about the other functions. They just said, well, we sell stuff and then we produce it. And I would say that probably a good reason uh, why they were actually going out of business, and most of them have. <coughs> Granted, there was a flux in the economy, and there's a whole backstory to why we don't produce apparel in this country anymore. Uh, but at that time, about 50% of all apparel in the U.S. Uh, was made. 
is in the U.S. Today it's about 3%. Um, and companies who are, are struggling financially often cut corners on all of these functions. Um, what, uh, what you really need to do is, is not um, think of this as you need to hire somebody for each of these positions. Ultimately, that would be awesome if one person was doing one function. But um, when I started Ethics Ventures, it was just me and I had to do all of these functions. So the most important thing for you to do when you're developing your business and developing your business process is to just make sure that you're covering all of these bases. Because if you're not doing all these functions, if you're not paying attention to your marketing, you're not paying attention to your sales, your operations, your product development, or your pr production and your product development, um, you don't have a gear working. And you're not going to make the money that you need to make <coughs> to stay functional. Uh, so, does everybody understand that generally? Does anybody have any questions on that? So, <coughs> you know, I guess to dig a little bit deeper uh, in, uh, in 2001, uh, the, the fall of 2001 was place to be in New York. I was there at the time. But, um, the industry had really slid out. I had wanted out of the industry and um, I had wanted out of New York. Um, I was originally from Lister. I was looking for a reason to come back to Massachusetts and I was lucky enough to meet Ben Cohen of Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream. And uh, he had um, just sold Ben & Jerry's a couple of years before and uh, he had got into a uh, domestic uh, manufacturing uh, company <coughs> or had started it with a venture capital fund that he had and um, it wasn't working. Um, it happened to be a cooperative. It happened to be uh, a very large and very public and um, very media friendly company and everyone was watching him uh, to see if the ice cream man had some magic uh, syrup uh, that he could just pour on uh, an industry that was failing. Uh, but uh, the cooperative was failing. It was 40 members. Uh, they were trying to sell apparel and sell apparel. And I was asked to come in and try to figure out uh, how to salvage it. Um, it's where I learned about cooperatives. It's where I learned about the value of worker ownership, about the history, the 200 year history of worker ownership. Um, and uh, it's what I based my company on when I eventually closed uh, this large manufacturing facility and liquidated all the assets and turned the keys back over to the landlord. Um, it was especially uh, difficult for me because. Uh, 40 people who were there uh, all had high, very high hopes of owning their own business and, and really believed that they couldn't be stopped. And I think that's a very valuable emotion, a very valuable feeling is that you can't be stopped. Um, but they weren't paying attention to their, uh, their watch. Um, and the company was I know you usually read, sorry, I'm going to borrow this again. <laughs> um, usually read right to left, but um, the important thing about this is it's really, it's two dimensional because I have to put it on paper. But I would say it's more cylindrical in a way, in that um, each of these functions tends to work with the functions to either side of it. So operations tends to work with sales and production. Sales tends to work with operations and marketing. Production tends to work with operations and product development. And then product development, although they're working with production, are also working with marketing. Uh, and so often when these things overlap, you forget that it's a separate function from what you're doing. Um, 
but uh, the lines on this chart are, are really representing communication uh, and how you communicate with each other. It can be through technology, it can be through email, phone, uh, it can be through policies and procedures that you write. Uh, sometimes uh, if somebody sells something, um, they have to tell operations that they sold it so that operations can do their production. It's not uncommon to have a procedure where sales uh, can reach over and do something in marketing. Uh, the key is uh, to talk about it, to communicate with each other so you know what that function is. Uh, in a way, it's, it's, it's really team-oriented, and um, you have to find ways to communicate and set up your communication structure so that you're not overlapping your jobs, you're not doing twice the work. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I see so often is uh, people are replicating other people's effort. Uh, I have a kind of a joke rule in the company that I work for of uh, telling people not to do my job. And I encourage everybody else to tell everybody else, don't do my job. Um, it's a nice way of also saying, do your job. Way. Um, because uh, you know, structure isn't uh, something I love, and it's not something that came naturally to in my life. But when I watched so many companies fail, and I watched so many people go out of business, I started to understand and appreciate what structure does for companies. Um, and it's uh, it's really important to to keep in mind, I, I don't know how many uh, of you guys have, have really thought through what you do for marketing um, or what you do as sales channels to develop sales for your company. Um, but I think there's four components to marketing. I think uh, the most important is market research um, because if you don't know uh, what your competition is or what your industry is or who you're trying to sell your services or product to and what their costs are and, and what value they bring to the clients already. Uh, you could come up with an idea um, that uh, simply isn't affordable to people. Or you could come up with an idea that nobody wants. If you don't know if somebody wants the service. Um, and market research isn't done once, it's done constantly. You're constantly researching your market. You're constantly trying to figure out what your company can do to better service your clients and your future prospects. Uh, public relations, you know, that's uh, a big uh, catchphrase, uh, but it really means, uh, you know, what do you do to get the word out about what you do? Uh, I think of the difference between advertising and public public relations of what do you do to get your word out for free, and what do you do to get your word out pay for. Um, it's very nice to hear that you actually get paid for advertising. That's uh, yeah. unique. <laughs> um, yeah. We advertise for other people on yeah, our cats. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, mm -hmm. merchandising is really uh, simply taking uh, your market research, working with product development on what you're going <coughs> to actually be selling to people, and figuring out how to position it in the market. What offering do you have? Um, what services do you have in landscaping? And, and how do you present that to people? Uh, these four things all have to happen at the same time. You know, this, this isn't uh, step one, step two, step three, step four. Um, as anybody who's operating a business knows now, you're constantly pulled between all these things. And uh, you notice your marketing is not you're not focusing on the marketing when your sales start to dip. But if, if, if you wait until your sales are down here, it's very hard to go back over to marketing and start cranking marketing up uh, to get sales back in. You really have to do that before sales dip. And, and you learn that over time because you'll see ebbs and flows to your business. But um, it's really important uh, to stay focused on the marketing. 
selling <coughs> certainly never came natural to me. Um, I was very shy. Um, I didn't really know uh, what selling meant or was. I, I always thought of it as kind of sneak oil. Um, you're trying to get somebody to buy something that they don't want or uh, you're trying to hustle somebody for something. But if you're out there selling your services, uh, sorry, but I just remembered my very first selling experience. Uh, was in grammar school, and uh, my teachers got me all excited. Uh, they they told me we were going to do a fundraiser, and uh, they were going to bring oranges up from Florida in the middle of the winter. And uh, at that time, we couldn't even buy oranges. I know it might sound weird, but. Uh, Selling you something that you have to do constantly with your business. Um, it's not uh, snake oil. It's not. Uh, it's not a negative. It's it's a positive. You have to be constantly um, telling people about what you do, uh, networking with people, and, and you, know, you find connections with uh, other people and, and other ways to develop business. Um, and ultimately, if your marketing is is merchandise correctly, then you can explain what your sales offer is like that. You know, it should be a one minute, um, you know, what can I do to, to support what you're doing? <coughs> you know, you have to be able to say very directly, this is, uh, this is what we offer. That's what merchandising is, is, is what are you offering? Um, what can I pay you to do or what can I pay you for? This is really cool. Um, it's uh, very easy to explain, as, as he did in less than 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> um, but once you sell it, you know, uh, you you got to figure out how to get it to the person, or to the company, or to the organization. How you deliver it, and and operations um, is really logistics. Keeping track of, of your product or service uh, and making sure that it, uh, it gets where it has to be in the condition that it's wanted, uh, the service level that someone bought or the product level that somebody bought. Um, it keeps track of addresses. Uh, you know, there are lots of ways to aid logistics. It depends on what you're what you're trying to get from point A to point B. It's why I left these blocks open. You know, for me and what I do, it's it's pretty simple. I have three things that we develop constantly, three things that we sell constantly, and they're the same line. Uh, we develop graphics uh, and we produce graphics on clothing and on hard goods merchandise. We develop uh, embellishment or some means to get that graphic onto something, um, and then we produce it by screen printing, embroidery, uh, heat transfer mechanisms, digital printing, um, and the last is the blank substrate we develop. So uh, the base.
basic is you need a t-shirt, uh, you need a graphic, you need a way to get that t-shirt on the graphic. Um, it gets complex because we work with you know, about 2,000 different products that all uh, require different embellishment techniques or different graphic uh, elements or adjustments. Um, so to keep track of all that, it's, it's not as simple as saying, hey, we sold T-shirt, so produce it. Um, you know, there's there's purchase orders that need to go out to get blank T-shirts moving. There's logistics that have to happen to move the raw components from point A to point B. Um, there's accounting that needs to be happening at all times. Um, and um, you know the other part of operations, really the, the heart of operations. Um, is a human resource function. Um, it's really important not to forget that um, I'm guessing with all of your companies that it's humans that drive your business. Um, that without humans you have nothing to sell or nothing uh, to market uh, or nothing to develop. And um, you know, we're, we all have human resources functions. We might not have a human resources department handbook, but you're all uh, providing resources to the humans that you work with. And uh, you know, customer service uh, or inside sales, um, you know, once you sell something, how do you service uh, the people that bought from you? Um, and I, w I just group facilities maintenance. You know, don't forget to take out the trash. Um, it's really an important function. Keeping the place uh, clean, uh, keeping it inviting, keeping it functional. Um, it, it's something you have to think about because uh, if you don't uh, think about how you keep your, your physical place of operation uh, functional, it falls apart eventually. Um, and if you don't talk about it, just like all these functions, you need to talk amongst yourselves and communicate about who's going to do what and how they're going to do it and set up policies to make sure that all of this gets done, you know, ultimately uh, your gears lose that time. And, um, you know, the, the thing that I've seen over the long term, uh, I've watched many companies go through phases like this, losing time is really painful. Um, and really negative things come out when you're losing, when you're organization, a company is losing time. Angst, animosity, um, blame, um, you know, it's, it's called going bad way. When things are going bad way, um, I think there's part of human nature to, to not accept the blame yourself and to want to push blame off. Um, and if you feel that, you know, look at this. Um, ask yourself, are you covering all these functions? Because the statistic is true. Nine out of ten businesses don't make it. Um, it's even higher than that, actually. Um, and it's because uh, all these functions aren't getting uh, paid attention to. So uh, I know I'm probably taking too much time back. But, um, how much time do I have? There's another 15 minutes. Yeah, because there's the, the two parts, right? I don't want to necessarily continue to pontificate on this, but um, I have a lot of experience in it, and I'd love to share it with you guys. So I don't know if any of this is registering or resonating with any of you, but uh, if you have questions, I'd love to answer them. So it's really resonating with us, with me. Um, but the challenge that um, I think we face that we're struggling with is that um, it's hard to address all of these functions without over-determining our roles because I don't think we want to assign one person to one function and uh, we don't have a lot of people so you know we have to as a group take care of multiple functions 
Um, so it's setting up those processes and those systems mm -hmm. and, make, and keeping, making ourselves accountable. That resonates. That sounds difficult. Um, I think Anything that you can do to communicate um, the feelings and, and the thoughts around it. Ultimately, um, the more people that get attracted to an idea, the more people seem to naturally fall into functions what they're good at. You know, if you can identify what people are good at and um, they can do naturally, it's better than them having to adapt their styles. Um, a lot of people. in adaptation of their natural mm -hmm. style. And that's why they don't like their job mostly. It's because they're, they're changing who they are to do a function. Uh, and that also uh, can breed animosity and angst of having to do something you, you're not naturally inclined to do. It doesn't mean uh, that you shouldn't do it because you don't like it. There's a difference between <coughs> being inclined to You know, I think, um, how many people are there in your organization? Five to seven. And um, do most people do actual um, landscape work? Yes, most people do actual landscape work. Not many of us have done, what, what's hard is the business end of things. Mm -hmm. The business development, doing the bookkeeping and figuring out, I mean, we're beginning, to, we're sort of slowly getting some systems in place, but um, having people follow the systems that we set up, that kind of thing, and it's, yeah, so I don't, I, it's hard for me to imagine breaking off those roles. Yeah. Well, if you don't, you'll go out of business. Uh, and I think that's an important message to get back to everybody that uh, you, can, you can move along and time can go by and you cannot address issues, but they don't go away. They stay with you and uh, eventually it's too late to go back or you can't go back. Um, so it's better to sit down and, and have a powwow and, or a retreat and, and you know, I think the tough thing about manufacturing is doing stuff with your hands all day, which is most of the people I've worked with is it's hard and it's tiring. And at the end of the day, you really don't, you, know, you want to take a break. You, know, you, don't, you don't want to turn it off. Um, it'd be really helpful if you guys could take a, a Saturday or you know, a day that you don't work um, and plan a day around just talking about your business. I think that's a really important function. And to, to just throw it on the table, um, you know, we're going to go out of business if we don't cover all of these functions. So let's talk about that. Uh, most people don't do that, and it's a really healthy exercise. I, what I would like to say is, like, usually in co small co-ops, you tend, it, it, people tend not to pay certain roles because they don't seem like a lot of work for some people. Like, oh, you sit in an office doing the invoicing or calling the client and somebody's breaking their back moving rocks or yeah. I don't know. Like I feel like in Beehive, like there with the bees and you know, getting stung and whatever. So I, I think one of the values that I have seen in regular businesses that sometimes we forget in the co op business is that every job should be paid fairly. Even though, like, that's the base of co-ops, that you're going to have a better environment and all that stuff. But I, I feel like people think the co-op businesses are easier than other regular one-owner kind of business. And, and I think it, it requires more work than a regular business is. Because it's not it's contradictory to the system that <coughs> you are living or set up. So I feel like one of the issues I have seen that I have fought for is like you know, the people that are doing accounting.
happy and should be just paid. And it should be valued less than actually beekeeping or, or breaking up rocks. And so there's a way of thinking that what's really the business is the breaking of the rocks and that the counting isn't bringing in the money. But it is, it's not a business unless you've got the account. Right. Yeah. I think that's a great point. It's like, if you're not getting all the functions done, you're not going to get any functions done eventually. And, um, you know, there's a concept of market value. You know, what does it cost to hire someone to run QuickBooks? Um, you know, that person that you hire, because ultimately you're the board of directors and you're directing your manager to hire somebody. Uh, they might happen to also be a board member, but your manager is, is asking someone to do books. Uh, they have to have an education and accounting to do that. So it's, not, uh, it's not easy to do. Um, it's costly. Um, and there's a return on that benefit of, of studying and doing that. And uh, if you don't pay them, they're going to go somewhere else that will pay them. Uh, and I think that's to keep in mind. They might love the co-op, they might be a part of the co-op, but eventually if you don't figure out a way to make enough money to pay them what fair market is going to pay them, they're not going to be there. And um, I know that's hard when you're when you don't have enough money to pay everybody. Um, but you know it's why uh, you have to have that conversation if you get all these functions done if we're eventually going to go out of business. Because you might already be on the path to going out of business and you don't even know that. You know. So often, uh, the path to going out of business starts years before when you start neglecting certain functions. Uh, but eventually... Yeah. Yeah. No. I'm sorry, you have a question? Okay. <laughs> this is just a quick thing. Um, um, Talk, talk a little about the difference between public relations and advertising. Can we go over that really quick again? Yeah, it's tough because uh, our business for a while has actually changed this chart. Um, we call it inbound and outbound uh, marketing uh, because we focus so much on internet marketing and business and um, pushing our message out uh, so that people call us. We actually don't do any outbound sales. Facebook and we've, uh, we've handed out flyers on trade show, like or trade show esque type things. Um, I think what's been most successful is just, I mean, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you know, those main two things: word of mouth, our clients talking to other potential clients, and then um, and um, Facebook. We've gotten 
Yeah. yeah. That's, 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 that's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything you can do for, it's not free, it's your time. You're investing your time, and your time can be invested in any one of these functions. Um, but when you're doing that, you're doing marketing. Um, and you, know, you should allocate X amount of uh, time to it. Or you said you have five or six or seven people. Um, you know, what is everybody doing during the day? What is everybody doing during the night? I mean, ultimately, no startup is a nine to five job. Um, it's a nine to nine job. Uh, not 12 hours, but 24 hours. Um, and you know, if the job doesn't get done, you're just procrastinating. So we're, we're basically um, a service-oriented cooperative. Do we have a production department then? Is that mostly just if you have a tangible product that you're selling? Um, well, I think that production is heavily, right? Like that that's is what you're production? selling okay. uh, yeah. is, is your woman power. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> is this going to the gym, <laughs> <laughs> But you're also selling the advertising space. So producing the ad, maybe yep. on that department. Um, okay. You know, you, you, who develops the <coughs> ad for you? Do they give you the ad, or do you have? We do. We do it internally. Yeah. So yeah. you're definitely uh, doing development work, and then you're producing. Um, I don't know how you get the ads on there, but yeah. you're probably outsourcing signage or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you th would something to continue with? Soul Cherries as an example, with something like Miles Pedal or like some kind of seemingly abstract measurement like that be an accurate placeholder for something in the production column? Um, well, yeah, I mean, you know what you produce per year, you know how many revolutions you produce per year, you know who produces them. I mean, your vendors in production are really your people. Um, and uh, you know, there's, there's probably more things that you're producing. Um, you said you do delivery too. Um, so, uh, who? How do you know what when to deliver what? Um, yeah, we have like a delivery coordinator who will make a schedule or a route that yeah. needs to get delivered upon. So would that fall into production too, that kind of thing? I said yeah, logistics I is on here with the operation. Logistics, logistics, absolutely. Okay. Um, scheduling, uh, making yeah. sure everybody knows where the service has to be, when it has to be there. Um, but it sounds like most of your production is in and around uh, your actual physical labor mm -hmm. every day. So we're going to have a chance to split into groups and talk specifically about our co-ops structure and, and business systems. Do we still have time to, to have maybe a 10-minute conversation about working together or how saturated our movement is? Do we have time for that? Or we yeah, and then afterwards we take a break. And then take a break and then split into groups. Anything else on big group business systems with us? So let me try to frame this real quick. Um, is Kai there? Is our Consilla go? Um, so principle six, who knows what principle six of the cooperative principles is? Nope. 
What is it? Which one is number six? Collaborate. Okay. Cooperation amongst cooperatives, right? So there are many principles. One of the most important is the idea that we can cooperate amongst cooperatives and, and create an ecosystem that supports the whole cooperative movement, right? Um, what's that? And community, yeah. It supports beyond the cooperatives, it, it supports the community. So um, we're we're in this place where we're we're trying to build co-ops, and in this little Blackstone Valley, there are you know ten or so that are connected to this co-op academy, right? And how I think the question on the table is how do we support each other and not compete with each other um, for this uh, you know for this movement, right? So. How does Toxic Soil Busters not compete with Diggers Landscaping when we both do landscaping work, but do we work together and, and, and coordinate with each other and, and uh, get each other the kinds of niche markets that, that make sense? How does iCulture Tees and Works Printing Co-op uh, connect, coordinate, or, um, or figure out you know, what makes sense in, in this market instead of competing for a, um, a similar market? And there's probably other examples out there. And I wanted to open this up um, while we had, I think, I don't think David had a chance to introduce himself either, but while we have David and Kevin from Works here today, um, and uh, and just get, because I think it, this is a big part of the Co-op Academy. We're doing the nitty gritty, right? We're doing the business plan and all that stuff, but this is also about building um, this ecosystem and this cooperation amongst our different co-ops, right? So I just wanted to pause for maybe 10 minutes and, and talk about that. How do we do that better? Um, and where are the potential pitfalls of trying to start or convert or work with 10, you know, fledgling cooperatives all at the same time? Um, yeah. Okay. Because Kai's the only iCulture T representative. Yeah. <laughs> So, so Matt wanted to open it up for discussion about how cooperatives, helping other cooperatives in this learning setting and also outside of this learning setting to advance each other and, and not compete in, in, in specific, but also support and enhance each other. Well, I think the first really obvious one to me is like the, um, you know, the t-shirt and graphics groups um, being a really clear collaborator with all the other co-ops because all the co-ops need t-shirts, you know, everyone needs t-shirts. So I feel like that's like one clear like avenue to like start the conversation. Like every, everyone here could use a t-shirt with our co-op's name on it. So that's collaboration. It might fall under uh, marketing. Kai, have you and Kevin talked? She was going to talk. Yeah, um, I emailed you guys like a while ago saying that our demographics are totally different. You guys are targeting to like merchandise for like established businesses and we're just mostly retail with like a little side business for other demographic, uh, other small businesses that are with our demographic. Like we do have small jobs available for um, the Y and the um, Salvation Army, which are both, you know, a youth-oriented thing. Mm -hmm. Also, our retail is towards youth, so I really didn't see the problem at all. Like, I don't feel like our demographics are going to clash or compete or um, I guess I would say our demographics are exactly the same, and uh, I think uh, doing market research, it's, it's hard for me to talk from both the business owner perspective and trying to help you in your business because you decided to, to me to be direct competition to our business. Um, because Salvation Armies and YMCA's we work with all over the country. Um, we found it works to work in Worcester with organizations like that. And um, it's, a, it's a difficult problem to have when we have such a small group of cooperatives um, to have competing cooperatives. I don't necessarily think we should spend the time um, 
caring that are trying to figure it out and I'm happy to talk in depth to you about it. What I can tell you from what I know about watching apparel businesses for 20 years is that everyone goes in with the intention of doing retail and everyone ends up doing wholesale because it's what supports your business. So you might think you're going in to just work with a couple groups or a couple organizations, but if you do that, you, the word is going to spread and we're going to end up trying to get the same clients in Worcester. It's a small area. So I don't know how to solve it, but um, I know that I'm open to any and all thinking on it. And not to pick on this one situation, this is a, a movement issue, right? This is how we strategically know what's going on and, and support each other to, to make the right decisions of, of business plans and and know the need of, of the community, right? So, um, and so there was a concrete suggestion to, to buy from each other, right? To, to actually use each other's services and, and support it if you're doing an event that could use transportation, think of Soul Chariots or, or the uh, Green Drive bus. Um, if you're doing merchandising on apparel, think about Works Printing Co-op. Um, they've already, and then supporting the movement too, giving back when you are able or profitable, right? So Works Printing Co-op has already donated some t-shirts to uh, to the We Own It campaign, for example, and, and lots of people here have donated stuff uh, to, to the movement. So those are some key examples. If I can throw one comparable to this. Um, I was asked to facilitate a discussion once. I do a lot of work in the national anti-sweatshop movement. So there's a lot of groups and organizations um, uh, who try to combat sweatshop issues in a lot of different ways. Um, sadly, most of our good resources go to uh, people starting companies. Um, and I see them start them a lot. And uh, everybody rushes to the front line to try to sell somebody um, sweatshop free apparel. Um, and I was asked to facilitate a discussion of how the anti sweatshop movement could work together better. And it was interesting that you went directly to it and picked up the chart because that's what I said to say that we're all actually working for the same company, um, the same principles apply. If we want the cooperative movement in Worcester to be successful or in New England to be successful, um, we have to look at what are we, what is our chart, you know, uh, how are we general managing it? Um, right now, I kind of see Matt in the function of general management because he seems to be a center go-to for people. Um, but are we marketing? You know, are we all doing different marketing for the same thing? Are we overlapping in any way? Are there sales opportunities or marketing opportunities that can get people to support cooperatives, a cooperative directory, or you know, co-op advertising? Um, if someone's going to take an ad out. Um, you know, it's going to cost a lot less to split it among six or seven cooperatives and each get a statement about what you do and make the ad more about supporting cooperatives. Um, and these are the seven ways you can do it, or ten ways you can do it. And then, you know, the, the operations and what we're producing, I mean, it, you know, it takes a while to digest it all and to think about how we could work together as a group. Um, I always go back to, you know, my first soccer coach. Um, I'm coaching soccer now, so it's kind of weird, this uh, life parallel. Um, I coach six-year-old girls this year and how to learn to play soccer. Um, and I've actually used uh, Coach Dave Halleck's um, theory most of my life. He was coaching me when I was six, seven years old. And, um, you know, when I was that age, I thought I understood what soccer was. I thought I could just go out on the field and play the game. Um, but uh, every day that we played soccer, he just yelled one thing out on the field. Uh, we were the Bears, and he just yelled out, don't bunch up bears, don't bunch up, and he had a very thick voice, so it was more, don't bunch up bears, don't <laughs> bunch up, um, and what he was trying to get us to just understand is that there are 
positions or zones or, or places that you're supposed to be on the field. And, and um, after a year of yell getting yelled at, mostly, um, you know, we actually played goalie, we played defense, we played midfield, we played offense, and um, it was just that constant reminder of you can't you can't all run to the ball, you know, you can't all uh, go to the glory, go to the thing that's sexy or the, the part that um, the game is focused on. Um, otherwise, the other team's going to take the ball and just march right down the field and score. And I think what happened in the anti-sweatshop movement is when we got this critical mass of people together, ultimately everybody that was at that meeting had had so much uh, ego and pride about their individual idea that they retracted from it and they focused on their idea, which was a clothing line. Uh, there's so many other things that have to happen in a movement um, other than just try to get the money from a direct sale to retail. Um, there's all the capacity building things, um, all the operational things. Um, so I like the way that you were going or the directive you were going with that of what could we do together to um, better all. Yeah, I like the I like the potential of this conversation. I, f I feel like um, we should continue for another you know few minutes or so before we break. But that this is, you know, kind of the undercurrent of a conversation that's always happening, or hopefully would be always happening, of how we can, how, how us as cooperatives can work collectively to advance cooperatives. Right, that's the main idea. It also sounds like a like a topic for a retreat, a co. You know. oh, for so many retreats. Oh. Back down. Maybe we need a retreat session. One suggestion that I was going to make, uh, as just as a you know, thinking of a facilitator, I have put myself in the stack. Um, is the idea that I I would really love to see us, you know, in all our various movements for all the rights that were stolen from us as individuals in all kinds of walks of our lives, that we don't define ourselves in the negative, mm -hmm. but whenever we define ourselves in the positive. Mm -hmm. And that it, it's that we, we don't want to be in competition with each other. Mm -hmm. That Actually, that might not even be true, because I would love to be in a competition with a co-op and not someone else, me personally. So I don't even know if competition is necessarily a bad thing. But I know what I do want. I do want co-ops as a means of ending poverty. You know, and that's just where I'm coming at it from. Or at least co-ops as a means of ending my poverty. <laughs> and I feel like everybody in this room has got some of that going on. And so maybe that we could start there. And how, what can we do in the things that we already are doing to advance ourselves and our cooperative family, and in the future, how can we continue that conversation? I just want to respond, and I don't think our movement needs a general manager or has one. But, um, <laughs> That's what all managers say. <laughs> yeah. But um, I do think our movement needs uh, some strategy and some campaigns that we're working on, and my organizing hat says, let's go after some, some bigger fish that can create better markets for us, right? So that's something Solidarity and Green Economy Alliance has thought about. So like institutions that do a lot of buying could buy from us, right? They could buy the food from the greenhouse co-op, they could do you know, whatever, land, whatever landscaping they, they subcontract, they could subcontract the diggers, they could buy robot components from, you know, we could go on and on, right? Buy their apparel from work. So, we could push some big institutions to do some of that purchasing locally. And that's the main campaign that SAGE has come up with and that Roots has been working on. Um, so we invite you all to, to get involved in, in that um, and shape it however it makes sense for your co-op or for what you think the movement needs. 
Um, and so there are SAGE meetings that are the third Thursday of the month um, here at 5.30. And there's a Worcester Roots event. It's called Friendsgiving event. Savvy can tell you more about it when she's here later. But in case you have to leave, here's a little flyer um, where we'll be you know, doing some of the strategy work. Anybody uh, else have comments? Yes. So, <coughs> Fair is uh, uh, the, the retail side of uh, what we do. The, uh, um, the, the, the group of founders at Neuromotics is also the founders of the Technical Community mm -hmm. Airspace, which is uh, the, the not for profit half. But one of the interesting advantages of uh, community shared high value add capital equipment is that cooperatives can immediately gain access to uh, uh, the ability to produce uh, very high value add goods uh, with uh, in, the, in the same way that the non-cooperative economy is doing it with automation. Uh, and being able to uh, work at places where uh, uh, even if it's not one of the robots in the facility, something as simple as manufacturing tools for oneself, manufacturing uh, greenhouse equipment, manufacturing the beehives, uh, manufacturing the screen printing, uh, uh, automation and alignment kits. Uh, these are the sorts of things that instead of becoming uh, that, that community tool shares can offer to these various organizations, instead of being uh, looking to the, the external market as the source of all productive equipment, start looking back inwards for the, the tools and then uh, the what those uh, the actual value add of the tools you have are you know bicycles are the value add for uh, uh, their um, uh, petty cat sorry thank you uh, that's uh, ultimately that is a tool to which they apply their labor um, but you know they're talking about putting in batteries and solar panels why not do that at a maker space as opposed to spend, spending thousands and thousands of dollars somewhere else to just buy one off the shelf. These are the sorts of things where if you look at um, costing options and production, specifically production, how are you producing the things and how are, you, uh, are the tools that you're using to produce uh, themselves produced, that there are uh, sort of zoomed out ecosystems um, that, that can be formed. So uh, maker spaces, if you're in Worcester, come see us. If you're not in Worcester, there are always local ones, uh, and they're certainly worth it. Sure. Is there any way for us to find out more information about that, about the makerspace? Like uh, yeah, technocopia.org or you can add cards. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to make a comment kind of off of what Matt was saying about SAGE. Uh, the most recent SAGE assembly, the conclusion was basically exactly what we're talking about now, like sort of like to, you know, form an alliance among cooperatives, at least my take home from that of what I remember was like a, a big component of it was that um, really for it to function and work well it needs the energy of people in the cooperatives so if like each of us like for instance in this room were able to devote some time to like or one of the people on the co-ops each of the co-ops in this room were able to have someone devote some time to um, moving forward some central being that could sort of help all of us um, you know, get work so that there could be sort of more of a um, more of a s streamlined um, connection between consumers and producers. Do you know anybody who could build us a website that could focus on all of our uh, cooperatives? Focus. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Future focus. Future uh, focus. Collective <laughs> website. Yeah, that could be a good launching point. It's a, a web a web presence. Yeah, a wiki. Yeah. Can have a wiki and can a, can a maker space produce wood chips and poop for compost? Uh, uh, it can podcast? produce chippers and uh, mulchers. Uh, we actually have uh, uh, manufactured little small tabletop ones, uh, and we're going to uh, be working with uh, Ferromorphic to take the uh, 3D printed parts and uh, get them cast in iron. Wow. Correction right. stage is second Thursday, so it's next week Thursday. Right. So, uh, kind of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had a, an idea. It seems as if, um, 
Aska was explaining, as Aska was explaining this uh, chart, I was just, it was, it was very much um, striking me as very true. Like, I, it felt like his observations and his, his presentation was very true. Um, and 